Welcome to this lecture tutorial. In this video, we're going to be answering biology past papers. So as you can see projected on the screen is a biology past paper from the year 2020. Question 1 says, determine the electronic configuration of the sodium ion. So what do we need to answer this question? So first of all, we need to check on the atomic number of sodium from our periodic tables. So our atomic number is actually 11. <coughs> what else do we need to know? So the sodium that we've been given is actually a cation because it has been ionized. So meaning that we have lost one electron. This negative there just simply symbolizing that we've lost an electron. Then what else do we need to answer such a question? So we know that the atomic number will actually be equal to our number of electrons. So for sodium that is not ionized, we're going to have 11 as our number of electrons. But for ionized sodium, we're going to have... Um, electrons that are either more or less based on the charge that we have. So the cation there means that it has lost one electron. So we're going to have our 11 minus 1 as our number of electrons. So our electrons will basically be equal to 10. So we've established that we're working against as our number of electrons. What else do we need? So, to write the electronic configuration, we need to uh, follow the rules uh, where we have uh, the numbers representing the number of shells and the letters representing the orbitals. So, we have the 1s orbital. The S orbital is able to accommodate a maximum number of two electrons. So this is in the first shell. So in the first shell, we only have one orbital. Then the second shell, we have the S, of course, there with two as the maximum. Then we have the two P. So the P orbital is able to accommodate a maximum number of six electrons. So we are working against uh, electrons that are 10. So in this case, we've already used up 4 to write our configuration and we're remaining with 6 because 10 minus 4 is actually 6. And that 6 is the same maximum number that the p orbital can hold. So that means our p there will have 6 electrons. Yeah, so... Looking at this, we can compare this configuration to the configurations that have been given. And as you can see, option 5 is basically uh, the most probable answer because it is 1s2, 1s2, 2s2, and 2p6. Alright, so we can move on to the next question, question 2. So question two is saying, determine the number of electrons in the outermost shell of an element with atomic number 16. So again, we need to write down what we know before uh, we can deduce the right answer. So this goes down to um, what we know about shells. So we have the KL uh, MN configuration from our secondary school, from our secondary school chemistry, right? Yeah. So we have the K, which can hold up uh, a maximum of two electrons. Then we have the L, which can hold up a maximum of eight electrons. Then we have the M which can hold up a maximum of 18. 
and then we have the N which can hold up a maximum of 36 electrons. So based on this, um, we can use our 16 there to place our figures. So for an atom with uh, 16 as its atomic number, we're going to have 2, 8. So we've already used up 10 because 2 plus 8 is 10. So meaning we're remaining with 6 from 16. So this, this orbital here, or this shell rather, is able to hold up to 18 electrons. So meaning that our 6 can still be in there. So what is the last shell? We have the M shell, right? And what's in the M shell? We have our 6 there as the number of electrons in the outermost shell. So based on that, we can deduce that option 2 is actually our answer there. Okay. So um, we can move on to the next question. So question three reads, uh, an atomic, or choose the correct statement. One, an atomic orbital can have a maximum of two shells. So here we're going to work with our substitution method. So this statement is saying an atomic orbital can have a maximum of two shells. So this statement is actually against the law of the shells and orbitals because orbitals are contained within a shell and not an orbital containing shells. So this was uh, reversed and therefore it doesn't qualify to be our answer. Option 2 says uh, an atomic shell can have a maximum of two atomic orbitals. Again, this is false because uh, from question 1, we've established that um, the S orbital, the first S orbital in the first shell can hold up to two electrons. So it is only one because the first shell only has um, one orbital. So that means... Uh, we have a minimum of one, right? But we also have the third shell. The third shell can hold up so many orbitals. As if we use the formula 2n, 2n squared to find the number of electrons. So for n, n represents the number of shells. Right? Yeah. So orbitals. Orbitals, the, the rule of orbitals is that um, one orbital can hold up two electrons. Two electrons with two different spins. So, for example, if uh, our N there, we get our N uh, to be, let's say, two. So, that means two squared, which is four times two, is eight. So we'll have eight electrons, maximum electrons in the second shell. So meaning, if we follow the rule of orbitals, this will have to be divided by two, and that will give us a four. So meaning we're going to have four orbitals in this shell. So this statement is saying the maximum a shell can have is two orbitals is actually false, because based on this fact, we can have more orbitals in a shell. Then option three says the second atomic shell can have a maximum of eight electrons. This is very true because based on the K, L, M, N, what we figured out above there, we said um, it, uh, we wrote a configuration of two, eight, eighteen, and uh, thirty-six. So based on that, we can tell that the second shell is actually having a maximum of eight electrons. Then option four says the first atomic shell can be occupied by a maximum of three orbitals. This is wrong because the first atomic shell can be only be occupied by one orbital. So this is also false. Then option five says the S orbital has higher energy than the P orbital of the same shell. So this is actually reverse because the right statement should have been the P orbital having higher energy than the S orbital. Because as you move further away from the nuclei, the energy levels increase. So this was also false. 
yeah so that's it for option for question three then moving on to question uh, four so question four is saying insects can walk on the surface of water body because of one the presence of covalent bonds in the water mm. So in as much as this may sound right, this is wrong because these are intramolecular forces. And um, this, this is uh, in one, one water molecule. So we can't qualify this to be as an answer because uh, mostly when we look at um, the reason why insects are able to walk on water is because the water, the water surface is like, um, for lack of a better word, the water surface is like intact for it to walk on it because if it wasn't intact the moment the insect step steps on it it's going to get displaced then there's two adhesion between the insect legs and water molecules so again this might sound right but it is actually wrong because um, yes adhesion may occur between the insect legs and uh, the water molecules but no this may also displace the water as it is moving because the water may may start leaning on uh, the insect's body that means the surface of the water will be distorted then three is cohesion between the insects and water molecules again this is wrong because cohesion occurs between like molecules so meaning that uh, if we have cohesion of course which is there it's going to be between water molecules and not the insect legs in the water molecules then option four is capillarity between the water molecules in the water molecules rather again this is wrong because uh, when we talk of capillarity we are talking about uh, the absorption of water and stuff like that then uh, option five is uh, the presence of hydrogen bonds between the water molecules this is actually very right because um Insects are able to walk on water because of surface tension. And that surface tension is attributed by the presence of hydrogen bonds. So that makes option four as our best and correct answer. So let me just clear this so we can move to question five. So question five reads, water bodies have a relative constant temperature surface temperature because one water freezes at four degrees celsius this is wrong this is wrong um 